in any business, if you, you don't fail in restaurants because you make bad food. You fail because you can't get them in your doors. In any business. I don't care what you're selling or making. Yeah. If your customer doesn't know about you, it really doesn't matter what you, how good you really are. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Prestige Living Podcast. So with that, who do you want to be? Hello, welcome to Prestige Living, the audio podcast that features the entrepreneurs in Orange County and shares the successes, struggles, and stories among the leaders right here in the community. I'm your host, Jay O'Brien, here with your co-host, Jordan Wilson. Yes. And Kane German. Hey, hey, hey. Today, our guest is a legend in the local community, starting his very first restaurant right here in Costa Mesa back in 1988. He describes the establishment as a place you go before or after the main event, prior to going to the movies or after leaving the gym, that sort of thing. It's a little place you may have heard of. It's called Wahoo's Fish Tacos. (laughs) Uh, 18 months after opening his first location, he soon opened his second restaurant. He later franchised the operation and now has locations in Southern and Northern California, Colorado, Texas, Nevada, Nebraska, Hawaii, Pennsylvania, and Japan. We're extremely excited to have him on the show with us today. And without further ado, I give you Wing Lamb. Wing, welcome to the show. Wing, thank you. Thanks for having me, Jay. (laughs) Yeah, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate it. So, um, you know, we've seen like a few different interviews and videos and whatnot Mm -hmm. that you've done. I'm sure you do stuff like this all the time. So we really appreciate it. Um, But yeah, let's kind of take it back from the beginning. You grew up in the area, right? Um, yeah. Estancia High School. Estancia class of 1979. All right. Yeah. My, my mother went there, too. I think she's a little older, though. She <laughs> probably graduated 10 years prior to you. Oh, okay. um, but yeah. She's not going to appreciate you saying that. <laughs> yeah. She, she's <laughs> not a, don't she, listen to this. She's <laughs> not an avid listener of the podcast. <laughs> um, so, so walk us through it a little bit. I mean, were, what were you doing prior to Wahoos? Were you dabbling in business owning or self-employed, or what were you doing? Uh, of all things that I could have been doing, I was in aerospace. Oh, really? Yeah. I I worked for Rockwell International on the space shuttle program back in the late 80s. And I also worked for another company called Sparta Incorporated. And a little bit shortly after that, I was doing some investment work with another buddy of mine from high school, Greg Reese, another Estancia alumni, uh, who had a little real estate investment family, I guess, franchise in Costa Mesa. Uh And uh, through that, I basically were looking at real estate, you know, deals. And I saw uh, the location across the street from where I am for sale, uh, Pea Cake Burgers on uh, 19 oh, yeah. Placentia. Yep. Yeah, I've had the breakfast burritos over yeah. there. Yeah, and back then it was literally a little shack that you walk right up to the window and there's a couple of benches outside. It wasn't the building that you see today. Yeah. And I thought, hmm, it's a good location, but not big enough to have a restaurant. If I wanted to have a taco stand, that would have been perfect. But I had a vision of having a place where you can actually sit down and have your friends over. Uh-huh. And a park bench, I didn't think, suited that. Yeah. And luckily, literally about a month after that, uh, Luigi's, the Italian restaurant where we opened our first restaurant, went up for sale. And there's really never, when businesses are up for sale, there's no for sale sign on the window sure. while they're in operation. So had I not been working with Greg and his family, uh, I would have never seen that opportunity. So like I said, things happen for a reason, whatever. And uh, we said, hey, let's make them an offer. And we were able to buy Luigi's out, get a nice little, I think the first lease we had was, I think there might have been maybe 10, 13 years left on that deal. It was a pretty sweet deal then because it wasn't that much money. And we literally converted a little Italian restaurant to the original first fish taco. And that was brand new to you, right? It was, it was like no new. restaurant experience. Well, I, I hate to cheat a little bit, but I, I call it no real restaurant experience. Okay. But my dad has been in the business since he was a kid with restaurants, literally had a food cart in Hong Kong. He ran five restaurants in Japan, opened the fir- one of the first Chinese restaurants in Brazil, which is where I was born and raised. Oh, wow, okay. And then still has a restaurant on Balbo Island, the Shanghai Pine Garden. It's mm-hmm. still there after, I don't know, 45 years. That's, that's great. So when you just got started with it, um, why the name Wahoo's? Well, you know, in business school, which is they teach you a few things. One, if you're going to try to be, you know, somebody new, you got to be way different. You can't be a me too kind of business. And we all know that there's plenty of Mexican restaurants around town. 
And I thought, okay, but there are no fish taco restaurants in right. the town. Then we had to come up with a name. So another great business that's in the area is uh, the Golden Truffle uh, over on Newport Boulevard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Alan Greedy and his, you know, we all went to high school together. He might, Alan actually might be closer to your mom's age. Okay. So anyway, Alan's cousin, Gary Greeley, had gone fishing and came back and said, hey, I'm going to have a Wahoo's Fish Taco Party. <laughs> and I thought he said the island of Oahu, like a Hawaiian theme park. Oh. He said, no, Wahoo's as in Ono. And literally, we're about a month out, and we couldn't come up with a name. Wow. And then he said, wow. He just rolled off the tongue. And I said, that's yeah. what we're going to call our restaurant. Light bulb moment. Yeah. So thanks, Gary Greeley, for the name. We still <laughs> laugh about it all these years. It's probably wow. the number one question I get asked all the time. How'd you come sure. up with a name? And that was it. And up until that day, I had never heard the word Wahoo. I always heard the word Ono is what, you call, what they call Wahoo in Hawaii. Wow, that's crazy. So when you got started with everything, are you cooking the, the food or are you start hiring straight away? Basically, I tore down the old renovation, right? Basically, whatever needed to go up or down, we did because we had no money. Right. So you do what you have to do. So I learned how to take off tile, roll this, roll that, paint, whatever I needed to do that I wasn't used to. And literally, I took the order I made the food, I prepped, I cleaned, I washed the dishes, whatever we need to do, because there's only like three of us, you know, in the Jeez. original store. My brothers, you know, were busy doing other stuff, plus we didn't have enough work for everybody, right? And, and when you got into your first place, when you bought when you bought Luigi's Pizza, were you still doing the aerospace stuff, like having the restaurant on the side business, or you just dedicated everything to the business? You gotta go full blown into the business. I mean, most people say, oh, I'm gonna try this. There's no such thing as try. I mean, you either play a sport or you are on the sidelines as a spectator. There's no such thing as, hey, coach, let me just go in there and just give it a shot for this three-point shot. Hmm. Well, nobody does that. you got to practice for that three-pointer, right? So you got to be in the game full, all, you know, all hands on deck. To piggyback off of, uh, off of Jay's question, where, you know, with um, you kind of running the show, where did you get your culinary influence? Was that family? Was that from your travels? How, how did that when you come to creating the menu, how did that come well, about? Well, it's funny is we borrowed and stole every recipe that we've ever liked. I've been in the restaurant industry before, yeah. or, and that happens all the time. Yeah, like people borrow from each other. Yeah, there's no such thing as a new thing. It's, yeah. There's always like, you know what? And maybe instead of this spice, I'm going to use this spice. So you modify it to sure. your liking, right? Maybe I'll use a little bit less garlic and a little bit more onions. So there's subtle differences, but for the most part, there's really nothing new you know, in, in the restaurant industry. So when you got started and you said it took 18 months before you could expand to the next location, right? Mm -hmm. So now, especially nowadays, we see a lot of the tech businesses and whatnot. They they just raise a ton of capital and they start, you know, going to town. But it sounds like from your story that the business really grew the business, and you you took the revenue and the growth and the profit, right. and then you, then you expanded to number two and so on and so forth. Yeah, because again, there's really no investment group out there just going oh restaurant where there's what ninety percent failure rate. Let me give you more money. Right. right. So you pretty much borrow and steal from the family and friends first and then after a few years if you're lucky there will be some outside capital available but so we had to wait about a year and a half until we had a little bit under our belts basically paid off all the original investment before we can venture out for the second location and how was that that ramping up with growth was it like okay we're you know we're making x amount of percent on profit so we're keeping our head above water and then just so much volume eventually you get to a point where okay we've you know, we can we can do this again. Or was there a point, and I know there was a point, but at what point, I guess, was there a tipping point where it was like, okay, yeah, like w this is this is completely dialed in. We, we're we gonna have the volume and we're not gonna have a problem. There's, I would say that most businesses will get some kind of an infusion. Because really, if you rely solely on the cash flow, it's literally about a store, about one and every other year kind of a deal, right? Okay. It's very difficult because it's, businesses in general are not very profitable. Sure. So we're basically just giving our 10 to 15% return on investment. So luckily, there wasn't a lot of capital that needed to get the first, let's say, three stores going. But after that, literally exponentially, it was a lot more. So literally between the first and the fourth store, it was almost seven times to maybe eight times the original investment. Mm -hmm. So think about it, right? When you okay. took 30000 to open the first one, 
at number four, you're at 250. And is that because real estate's going up? Is it everything's be- going up? Okay, right? Because the economy is now beginning to go right. So, it, and plus, it's one of those things where it's easier to find in a downturn economy locations that are in distress, distressed sure. property. Like what do you guys business are in, right? Mm-hmm. So buy low, sell high. The problem is once the market starts picking up, the buy low becomes a little higher. Right? Sure. You just got to figure out when the top is before it goes back down, right? right. So throughout the first 10 years, we were kind of going up. It was hard to go backwards because people also know who you are and they're not really you know, giving you the, the deal of the century, right? There aren't these for sale businesses. So we have to basically go into empty spaces where no longer do you have the ability to convert. You have to build everything out. So that's a major expense. An Italian restaurant, literally, the hood, the walk-in, the major uh, tenant improvements that needed to be done was already in place. Right. And so, and again, converting an existing restaurant, the permitting process is a lot easier. When you're doing it from scratch, you know, mm-hmm. just like a brand new build out, as opposed to a remodel, it just takes a little bit longer to get through the city and all that. And basically time is money. So we went from literally spending 30,000 on the first store basically 89,000 on the second store, 175 on the third store, to all of a sudden we're at 250. And this is literally over a four or five year period, wow. right? And no business does it cost 10 times whatever yeah. for the first one in that shorter period of time. But it had to do with the fact that Huntington Beach was a complete build out. Tustin, I mean, Lake Forest was a complete build out. It wasn't a conversion. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had too many conversions over the years. Every now and then we'll pick something like a La Jolla store was a conversion. So relatively speaking, you know, a couple hundred thousand, which is unheard of today, right? Got it. So now fast forward 27 years later, you're looking at 700,000 for a scratch. I mean, and again, but when you look at at a McDonald's or somebody like that, that's doing a freestanding, you're looking at 2 million bucks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if like to your point, in a four-year span, to for it to be ten times more and whatnot yeah. for the capital expense, the initial one, it's for most businesses it's kind of unheard of. Yeah, I would imagine that from whether it's four years or twenty-seven years, that the profit isn't on that same multiplier. So, what makes it justifiable yeah. to continue opening them? Well, it's one of those where by opening more stores, you are, you provide opportunities for your employees to move up with you, because remember. You got, let's say, 15 employees in a store. Well, you kind of have one store manager, maybe one kitchen supervisor, maybe one assistant. Well, the other 12 guys like, hey, I want to move up and make more money. So then you open a second store, now you got three uh, in three. So you're given six people. But now instead of six out of 15, it's six out of 30, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's not mm-hmm. like you have the same base still. Sure. So basically you're allowing people to grow with you. So that was one... Uh, part of the area that we like to provide opportunities for our employees to grow with us. The other is like our customer base. People are like, oh my God, you know, we have to drive 15 minutes from the other side of town to come to you. Or maybe we should open on the other side of town. Got it. So it was a combination of both. So I want to go back a little bit. What year did you, was your first location open? 1988. And then how did you build that? I mean, considering marketing's much different then and now. How did you build that? I mean, obviously, with word of mouth, your, your food is that awesome? No, no, no. You, in any business, if you, you don't fail in restaurants because you make bad food. You fail because you can't get them in the doors. In any business. I don't care what you're selling or making. Yeah. If a customer doesn't know about you, it really doesn't matter what you, how good you really are. So everyone will try it at least once, right? Yeah. But even then, I mean, just, just to get them to try the first yeah. time. I mean, right. in any business, because we're all servicing something. And there's probably a hundred of us in any category that can do almost the same thing, right? So I couldn't wait for them. The one trick that we did use a little bit back in the day, because uh, my dad's friend was one of the marketing guys for the penny saver. Oh, yeah. So one of the early tricks we did is it would cost us just as much money to print a menu and have it in our restaurant than it did for them to print it, give us the overrun, and mail out the rest. It was hmm. basically 500 bucks wow. to print a 1,000 menus. But the 500 I would give to them, they would send 10,000 out to the neighborhood hmm. and give me a 1,000 for the overrun. Wow. It was literally the same amount. So because funny. this is before digital and all that, right? Yeah. So that's who did our menus first. For the first probably five years, Penny Saver, Penny Saver did it and saved us. Because literally, 
every time they would send menus out to the neighborhood, there'd be a little bump in our traffic. Yeah. And it was awesome. And you could gauge it every single time a mailer would go out. So those are the early days before digital and all the stuff, right? So that saved us a lot. The biggest thing that came is because we opened strategically in Costa Mesa for two reasons. One, I knew the neighborhood because I'm an Estancia alumni, and I knew the Placentia is the corridor to the beach besides Newport Boulevard. It's the only other way to get there, right? Yeah. We also knew that all the surf companies in America had their headquarters in Costa Mesa. That was our biggest thing. And it's literally taking a line out of the movie. If you build, they'll come. Hmm. But you got to be close enough to them. So if we wanted to be the surf-inspired you know, restaurant, we needed to be close, not to the beach, but we need to be where the factories were at. Because right. these were the really hardcore surfers. These weren't your tourists. These are the guys working for the brands and telling the rest of the world, this is what the surf industry is all about. And that's exactly what you guys are thinking before you can open your first one? Yeah, because you needed to be close enough for them. Right? So Costa Mesa, there was more to it. It was home turf for us. There was a little bit of the alumni connection to the high school. But more important was the home base for Quicksilver and Billabong at the time. Stussy and Gotcha were in Irvine, but you had two of the four largest surf companies in the world at the time within literally a five to ten minute walk hmm. from my restaurant. So those employees would be coming over having their lunch and whatnot. Yeah. So literally, they started coming. And it was literally not a month, a month and a half after we opened the doors, the general sales manager for Billabong, Mike Lesher, comes in and thought, oh my God, I was here the first week you were open, and it was total chaos. So I came back, I wanted to wait a month and see if you guys are still around for an open hmm. business. Literally, that's what he said, right? And Mike, oh, whatever. And then he <clears> says, hey, congratulations. And I notice that all you guys wear are surf and t-shirts from the surf industry. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, how would you like to come and do a walkthrough at our headquarters? Oh, nice. And that literally lit the fire. So you now have literally billabong, head to toe. Our employees are wearing hats, shirts, and T-shirts, right? And literally, my other buddy at Quicksilver, like, dude, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I can't be served by a bunch of people wearing my competitors' clothes. <laughs> Let me send you a Shui box. So we had literally outfits from Billabong and Quicksilver. And I can tell you that it didn't take long for the rest of the companies to follow because they realized that we were walking billboards yeah. for them. In that culture, too. In that culture. So all of a sudden, remember we <laughs> talked about if you build, they'll come. So not only did we have the local reps coming, when they would bring the Laguna Surfing Sport, the Huntington Surfing Sport, the Newport Surfing Sports, the Jacks, all the big local accounts to preview some stuff at their warehouse. Guess where they brought him to lunch? <laughs> Dude. So my next question was going to be during that, you know, between the first restaurant opening and the 18 months after between the second, was there ever a moment where you thought this might not work? Judging by that story, it didn't sound like you ever had one of those moments. No, because literally two months in, once we, once Billabong gave us the green light, the, the big part that I forgot to mention in the story is it's not about taking stuff, it's about giving back. So I immediately asked Mike, I goes, hey, what do you guys do? And we started talking about you know, things that they did and how maybe I could find a way to support them back. Turns out that they said, hey, we got this crazy trade show coming up at the time, it's no longer around, but it used to be ASR, Action Sports Retail, where buyers from around the world would come in twice a year to buy the surf apparel, the extreme sports stuff, right? So the, he mentioned that we have a buyer's preview the day before the trade show. And he goes, okay. So they had about 100 buyers from around the world and said, can you come out and cater hmm. instead of us? Because we're not going to have time to come all the way to the restaurant. I'm like, sure. So I went out, literally borrowed some catering equipment, and we set up a taco stand in their parking lot. And the buyers were like, oh, my God. Right? And I'm thinking to myself, it's just tacos, right? But again, <laughs> when you're from the East Coast or wherever you're from, this is actually pretty good stuff. So <clears throat> we went through the whole process. And then what really kind of got it going was Mike said, hey, have you ever been to the trade show? And I'm like, no. He goes, well, you should come and check it out. And let me tell you, how do brands in the action sports industry promote their smells? Through stickers. That's the biggest thing they do. 
hand out stickers. But as a kid, have you ever had the money to go buy stickers in a surf shop? The big ones are like five right. bucks. Yeah. They're not cheap. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, okay, cool. So I go to Long Beach. It was the last ASR in Long Beach before they moved it to San Diego. And I'm walking like I'm a kid in a candy store. Every booth had piles of stickers. <laughs> Take as many as you want. I'm like, this is amazing, right? So I'm picking up stickers, right? And about every few aisles, I ran into a guy that I recognized from the restaurant. I says, well, I didn't know you worked for O'Neill. I didn't know you were for this brand, right? And they all said one thing. Hey, I heard that you did an event for Billabong yesterday. Uh, <laughs> and then he says, well, what else can you do? He goes, well, what else do you have in mind? He goes, well, we have surf contests. We have video premieres. We have, I'm like, sure, whatever. Just give me your card. So now I have literally three, four hundred stickers, <laughs> right? And I come back to the restaurant. And if you were at my restaurant the day before the trade show, there was nothing on the windows. There's a couple of pieces of art, and that was it. Because I didn't have any money. Yeah. I was in the business to make food. All of a sudden, I start putting stickers on the yep. windows. Yeah. To make it a little bit more story. like appealing, right? And literally, if you go to Wahoo's on Placentia, the stickers on the inside windows, starting from the door, going to your right, almost all of those are original stickers from 26 years ago. Oh, that man. January oh, man. of 89. There are some stickers that are over them, and there are companies that are long gone. And I can, you know, you can go through the stickers and go, oh my God, this company's not even around. Well, that was from that trade show. But now so people just go up and they just put a they sticker. They just put their sticker. And so that's the, how the sticker started, the whole wow. part. Because I went out and decorated. On top of it, I saw how these brands decorated their booths. And I said, hey, by the way, when you're done with this POP, I call it my point of purchase displays can I have this banner? And I'm like, yeah, when the trade show's over, I'll just bring it by and goes, awesome. So all of a sudden, I put my first, you know, Vision Streetwear banner, I put my first foam core billabong banner. And all the other companies goes, are you kidding me? I'm now <laughs> sitting in a restaurant where the employees work, my competitor stuff, my competitors are advertising, what do I have to do? He goes, maybe bring some over. And literally, the rest is history. And you have free decor, and, and you've built <laughs> and an, an image, entire yeah. culture around that. And that's how most surf shops do it. And now most surf shops even charge you for those window displays, right? Right. So yeah. I never did because I'm like, hey, this is really cool. Thank you, guys. And on top of it, I'm going, and when you have events, let's figure out how we can work together. Yeah. So I feel like we're sort of touching on what I wanted to ask you about. Um, I read an article um, written about you about how important you believe networking is. Oh, can you yeah. speak to the value of building up a network is? Yeah, the whole thing is about making sure that you know, they teach you in college what is the definition of synergy. When a group of people come together and you create something that's much bigger than you could have done it on your own. So four individuals doing it on their own, it's not the same as three people maybe working together. Because a lot of brainstorming, a lot more ideas come, a lot more creativity. So I figured out that instead of me trying to go out and literally set up a taco stand on the beach, would it be better if I was doing it during a surf contest? Would it be better if I was doing it at a skateboard contest? So by doing it together, we created this amazing experience for the athletes and the public and the consumer in general. So everything that we did just became better when we created this partnership. And I, again, I look back at, I was the only crazy guy at the time, you know, dumb enough or smart enough to go on the beach, right? To go on the skate park, to go on to the snowboard park, long before there was the X Games, right. you know? So that's the difference. And today, I mean, you see all the big brands out there. It's not the same because you will never see, you know, XYZ company on top of a mega ramp because they just don't belong. Right. 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 Yeah, they're not. They're they're very out of place. Uh -huh. If we rewind back to, I want to say it was 1998. Birdhouse did a video called "The End." Yes. And um, as you mentioned the stickers, I'm starting to think about this. Yeah. And I remember the scene, but. Um, they had a huge food fight in the back patio. Um, which location was that? That was right here. On Bristol and Baker. W when there was a patio yeah. there. Huh? There's and no patio. What, what so we what, did, yeah, what did so, you do? So what we did is, <clears throat> again, my buddy John Hampton, who at the time was the team manager for the team, they wanted us to help them with the premiere. In exchange, 
again, we're going to the barter thing. This is how do we integrate you guys into the video? So they went back and said, you know what? We want to create a scene because the whole thing about destroying America, right, was about this van that went around and hit everything. Yeah. It would just hit trees. It would hit anything, right? And Eric Estrada was in the movie. He's the cop, right? So everybody had a reason to do something. And, and the real reason Eric Estrada was in it was because his kids wanted to meet Tony Hawk. Uh. I mean, it's like, hey, we're all, everybody's got an agenda, right? Sure. So the donut scene that Eric runs out, uh -huh. the two kids that are with Eric are his actual kids. Oh, wow. Right? So that's Eric. In my world, they said, hey, maybe we can run through one of your patios. And I'm like, we, we don't have a patio. And if you ran through my patio with your van, it would cost me 50000 bucks yeah. to put it back together, right? right? I said, okay, then how are you going to do it? And he goes, how about if we stage it in the back of our parking lot? So we'll put the, the umbrellas, we'll do all the cheapest umbrellas and tables we can think of. And once your van runs over it, we're done. He goes, done. So we only had budget to do one take. Oh, man. Because once the van ran over the tables and chairs, you can't restage it, right? We did it old dark hundred in the morning, right? Just enough where the light was on. And we said, okay, we're we going to stage it, right? We didn't account for the fact that there were other cars in the area. <laughs> Luckily for us, None of the other cars got damaged. Oh, and we man. didn't think about it ahead of time. And we're like, oh my God. After the fact, well, that was so close. The second, I didn't realize you needed a permit to do anything. <laughs> because the car actually was on the street before it came into the parking lot. Had everything been done in the parking lot, it would have been okay. But the car was actually in the street before it came in. So we very quickly cleaned and hosed everything down. <laughs> and literally just about the time I was done, the, C, the local PD comes in and goes, hey, we heard some noise. Some neighbors were complaining. There was some noise. He goes, oh, I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then uh, after that, there was like the food fight scene. Yes. Right? It, yeah. Well, there's actually, there's a food fight scene. I think that's, I see we've done a couple of different ones. We did one in, uh, in our San Clemente store, in our patio. So we had okay. a couple of different things gotcha. over the years where Tony, uh, Willie Santos, all the different guys around the team all became friends of ours. So we would find different ways to integrate our brand into the storyline without you know, making it look too contrived. That's, that's so great. Yeah, it's totally built into the culture. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, you were looking up at the board of the morning routine. I'm curious as to know what, what yours looks like. What, what are some habits that you have and kind of how do you start your day? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's almost the same, but I find it that if you're able to, you know, and again, exercise and meditation comes in different forms. Uh, luckily for me, uh, surfing kind of fits like right on target with the both because it's kind of zen-like. You're there by yourself. Well, there's always friends around the neighborhood, but it's pretty, you know, fun because every wave is different. So there's a little bit of concentration, a little bit of meditation, and a little bit of exercise all in one. Do you surf every morning? I, I try to, but you know, Newport is finicky. Some days there is no waves. Some ways, some days the wind is up already. Some days the tide is high. But for the most part, if the surf is good, I like to be out there. Do you live out that way? Or you mentioned Santa Ana earlier. Oh no, our corporate offices are in Santa Ana, but okay. I live down in Newport, so I'm about a block from the ocean. That's perfect. What is your day? You know, he, Jay just kind of asked about the morning routine, but. What does your day look like today? What are your responsibilities that you handle today versus 1988 when you were first well, open? Well, uh, back in 88, a lot more in-store. And these days, I mean, I hate to use the word more, you know, from the 10,000 feet level. It's planning for ways to drive traffic into the store. I'm more concerned about, you know, getting the word out, and which means social media, interviews, uh, any PR, anything that I can do where I can then, you know, basically preach the gospel of what we do that's different than what our competitors do. And that's what I spent a lot of time doing. And then also, I mean, doing a lot of what I call event planning and event execution. And that comes in 10 million different forms. Yeah, so you, you had mentioned earlier, um, it's all about giving. Mm -hmm. We're huge believers of that, which I feel is almost hard to come by because everyone's got an agenda. I was talking about this last week. If you go through my messages on LinkedIn, yeah. every single direct message I've ever received is what Gary Vee would describe as a right hook. It's just, it's asking for something or telling me something. And, um, and so we're big believers of that too. Like demonstrate your value, add value to someone else before ever asking for anything from them. And I think that that goes not just for like a, for client acquisition, mm -hmm. but also with your employees, you yeah. know, 
And so I'm curious as to how you set up your company culture and maybe how that looks because it's definitely not the the buttoned up America. <laughs> you know, it's like you know people that are in surf esque attire. Yeah. It's a little bit more casual and just curious on the back end how you run things. Well, you always have to have the what I call the objective. Because if you kind of have a loosey-goosey, which what it appears to be, but we have a lot of systems in place that actually measure performance. But if you just do that, you're not going to be successful as either. So it's basically, you know, it's tough love, right? Here's the standards that you have to meet, the sales, the, you know, restaurant reviews, everything that needs to be, you know, your food costs. So we have all the objective metrics. Then we throw in the subjectives in there. We have open door policy. You got any issues, you don't have to call this person, this person before you can come and see me. You got a problem, come and see me, right? So the two-way communication, and we always have this feeling that you're never working for me, you're working with me, right? So I'm never gonna have you do something that I'm not willing to do it with you, right? And so I think that mutual respect, you know, you, you have a lot of that. So everybody's a team, or nobody's better than others. Yes, you all have titles, right? But at the end of the day, my employees know that if they want something, feel free to call me. I'll just, I'll laugh with them sometimes, goes, are you kidding me? This is what you really want, you know? And they're like, no, I really don't want it, but I just wanted to check in with you kind of a thing, right? So we always have the saying where, again, I know about their kids, they know about mine, and, and it's like a family environment. But you can't let anybody slack, because again, it's that tough love. You know, you let your kid get away with one thing, they're gonna get away with two, right? Right, right. So that's the mentality. Like, run it as professional as you can while still maintaining the good, hey, we're having fun while we're doing it. And how many total locations do you have right now? <clears throat> I think we're close to 65 locations. And at what point did the franchising thing come about? Um, was that when you went out of state? Uh, I believe we were into the business uh, probably about four or five years. And a friend of mine, uh, Mike, came in, a uh, friend of a friend, said, hey, I'm moving back to Colorado. Love to take the idea to Colorado. So I literally had him come and spend some time with me. And uh, after a year, he goes, I think I can do this thing. So we decided to open our first store, franchise in Denver, Colorado, in downtown. The timing was right. Lodo was re becoming, like it was the first, I think, I don't know, maybe national city to redevelop their downtown. That was, uh, you know, they call it, you know, like New York has got SoCo. There's all these acronyms, sure. right? So Lodo became Lower Downtown, and they were building a new Coors Field. So I'm like, okay. And in the back of my mind, I thought, you know what? I've always heard that there's some great resorts in Colorado that you can go snowboarding at. So maybe it's not a bad deal after all. If or see, in my head is, if it fails, it's all the way in Colorado. If it works, I get to come and go snowboarding. Right. <laughs> I like that. Worked so, out pretty well. So, I mean, because I was going to say, when you think Wahoos, you think it's it's a very California, it's very like a, a, a surf, skate, snow sort of yeah. thing. So if someone, I, I mean, you have one in Nebraska, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound like any of those things. So how does that store do there? And is the culture the same? Are there still stickers on the windows? Uh, actually, the, I called the kids from Nebraska, right? Uh, he went to a school at CU, Colorado, Boulder, okay. where we have a store. And when basically he graduated, called his dad. His dad is a big insurance guy in, in Denver. Say, hey, I'd like to, you know, take a chance and maybe open a store in Lincoln, Nebraska. So that's how Lincoln, Nebraska came about. <laughs> And um, if you're able to share what the franchising costs are, not the cost to, for not the capital cost, but the actual royalty or the uh, cost to get in. Sure. What we tell everybody is it's around forty thousand that you pay us for the rights to be into business with us. Most of that, almost ninety nine percent of that, and some, goes into training. So it's not like, ooh, we'll put 40000 in our pockets. It, it, there's no such thing. It's not a profit center for you. No. There's a lot of training that goes involved. And then there's a 5% annual royalty, which is pretty, I guess, not the highest, not the lowest in the industry. And again, a percentage of that also goes back to you in marketing support. Oh, right? And, and we, we're very, what I call it, open to, you don't have to do this. You say, if you want to get it back, you got to do something to get it back. Right? So we give them a few, what I call it, very easy to follow guidelines to get it back. And then on top of it, we'll, we, we, you know, we'll spend our money, part of the royalty that we get, to come out and do store inspections and retrain and all that throughout the year. 
So we're really like, we like to call our franchisees more partners as opposed to somebody that just pays us money and has to do things. Sure. You know? I saw a video uh, interview with you, and I really have to agree. You said um, you can't train people to be nice. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked in restaurants for since 2009 until 2015, last year, and I was one of the trainers, and I would tell the managers, like, you can't train people to be nice, and you can't train people to care. No. But, like, when I – and this is just – I'm saying, like, yeah. whenever I eat at, at Wahoo's, like, everyone there is so nice, and they all seem to actually, like, enjoy what they're doing, which is a nice feeling instead of someone who just, like, is there to collect a paycheck and yeah. hates it. Yeah, we tried. Like I said, you hire nice people. The interesting thing is I was with another guy, you know, not too long ago. uh, And we were talking about, like, what makes a good employee? And the other thing that he mentioned is their ability to adapt. Because things are not exactly the same every day. Not every customer acts the same way. So if you're able to adapt a little bit and adjust to the nice customers, to maybe the angry customers, Mm -hmm. to the unhappy, you can make your day go pretty well. So. And I always said, like, even if you're, like, have pride in your work, you yeah. know, even if you're doing a nasty job, be the yeah. best damn nasty job person that you can be, you know? Yep, yep. Any books you would recommend to any of the listeners? Oh, my God. I, I, I wish I had time <laughs> to, to read books. But what I tell people is look for people that are almost like, I don't like to use the word mentor, but if you're thinking about, let's say, real estate, go find you know, some of the best people you think are in the business and try to find a way to spend some time with them because the stuff that you're going to learn, I hate to say it, but they're really never in the books because that information is available to millions of people. But the one-on-one tidbits that you get, the inside scoop, I call it, you can only get from the, a real-life person because most people are never going to write that stuff down, right? So you really get to see, and you get to see their personality and understand the rationale behind what they do. So I would say like probably one of the best guys that I've ever seen speak would be like you hit to see you to use Anthony Robinson's example. So good. Right? But the guy's amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's not that what he has to say is that much different. It's his delivery and he is just dead on when he delivers, right? And he doesn't matter like he talks about he hits every sense and he reads you and gives you the message in a way that you're going to go, wow, this is the best thing I've ever heard. And it's the way he delivers. It's not what he says, right? right? Because he understands how you like to get the message. So if you can turn that into things, and you don't, you just can't get that out of a book. But meeting really what I call accomplished people, it doesn't mean they're smart, it doesn't mean anything. It's just you find out how they did it. You're like, hmm, I think I can do that, right? And so you talk to a lot of people. I mean... A big realtor in your end of town here, one of your friendly competitors, is Torelli. And she'll tell you. She basically followed one of the guys that followed Anthony. I mean, there's no mystery to how she succeeded. Sure. Right? And and I think her former boss was a Remax guy, when I think about it, in the Valley. But there's what they call it, uh, there's trails in every success. And you just follow the trail, you're not going to be that far off. So you just figure out the field that you think you want to be in. And you're going to find out one or two things. No, I thought that's what I wanted to do. Now I really never want to do that. Or, oh my God, it's that easy to do it. Hmm. Right. But you're not going to get that out of a book. Good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, advice. that's good. Um, you guys have anything else? I'm, I'm all good. I'm golden. What's next for Wahoos? What, um, any future expansions? Anything new going on? Uh, we just opened LAX. At Terminal 6, and Ooh. it's doing phenomenal for we'll, us. We'll be there uh, next week, Yeah, LAX. Alaska Airlines Terminal. So I have yeah. a question about that, actually. Um, to get into – I was like, going to ask you about South Coast Plaza getting yeah. in there, but getting into an airport, isn't that just like a gold mine? Because the idea is that you might have your peak hours in Newport and Costa Mesa because people on on their lunch break, right – and people might, and it's even harder because they have so many places to choose. Yeah. You go to LAX, there aren't that many places to choose. Any and, good places, yeah. And it doesn't matter if your flight's at 6 or at 10 p.m., it doesn't matter. You're going to eat, you're going to grab a drink. So it's just like a gold mine for a restaurant because you have consistent traffic all the time. It's never ending traffic. So is it? Look at the is, smile on his face right now when he's yeah. saying that. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, yeah, I'll give you some business cards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when you when you get that deal, is that something that people are like lined up for? Is it very expensive? Is it very exclusive? 
It's all of the above. <laughs> I mean, it's the ultimate, I hate to use the word, who you know, and if you can't network your way in, because anybody that's in doesn't want to get out. Right. And everybody wants to get in on top of it. Yeah. So every time these contracts are for renewal, they're renovating, whatever, there's a small window of opportunity. Trust me, there is. Yeah. But, you know, we, quote, unquote, missed out on Orange County. We didn't get in. Another group of my friends are all in Orange County, which is great for them. But it, I now look back and, you know, I'm not saying, thank God I'm not here. I'm just saying that LAX has turned out to be much better because sure. of sheer amount of traffic. Yeah, It man. is unbelievable how many flights are coming out of that. Just our Terminal 6 alone. Yeah. Oh, so it's a gold mine. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's Wing, awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. We sincerely appreciate it. Anytime. And uh, again, it's Wing Lamb, Wahoo's Fish Tacos. You probably know where it is. Probably doesn't need much more of a plug than that. <laughs> yeah, you know where it is. Thanks so much for being on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. If you would like to be on the Prestige Living Podcast or know someone that would be a great guest, go to www.prestigelivingpodcast.com. We'd love to hear your story.